1948. The Second World War had just ended. Governments were determined that the past should not be repeated. Avoiding war meant also avoiding the economic mistakes of the 20s and 30s. In erecting trade barriers, people thought they were protecting their economies. But as trade dried up, the result was economic ruin. So in 1948, the whole political and economic system needed to be overhauled. Stability, a sense of global community, they were the key. International organizations were created to restore economic cooperation and peace. Only 23 countries signed GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, but it turned out to be a major contributor to world economic security. Now, 50 years later, the World Trade Organization has 132 members. It has taken over the duties of the old GATT, but it's also handling new areas of trade. International banking, telecommunications, high technology inventions. The GATT brought order into the world jungle of trade because when you have the law of the jungle, the bigger animal eats the smaller animal. And it wasn't very much different in terms of world trade. Big countries, when there were no rules among countries, mutually agreed among all of them, could very easily exert more pressure than they could do in a multilateral system where every country has the means to uh, have itself be heard. The rules defined what governments could do and what they could not do with their trade policies. For example, countries could not discriminate between their trading partners. GATT also became a forum for countries to settle disputes and to negotiate lower trade barriers. Eight rounds of increasingly complex trade negotiations took place under GATT. All this meant a better climate for investment and job creation. In its 47 years, GATT saw trade barriers fall and an unprecedented growth in world trade. GATT's membership grew eventually from the original 23 to 128. Most were developing countries and were given special treatment to help them adjust to the rules. In the 1970s, a first major attempt to revise GATT rules was only partly successful. Relatively few countries signed all the new agreements of the Tokyo Round. Meanwhile, the global economy was going through a rough period because of sharp rises in oil prices and financial troubles. Protectionism threatened to return to world trade. Then in 1986, in Punta del Este, Uruguay, Ministers from all around the world gathered to launch an event that was to transform world trade, the eighth round of GATT negotiations, the Uruguay Round. The negotiations lasted seven and a half years, and at the end, 125 countries participated. The Uruguay Round became the largest and most complex negotiation in history. It covered some of the most sensitive subjects of the time, so the stakes were high. There is a sense at the same time of crisis, but also a very uh, responsible answer to this situation and a collective wish to see the multilateral system control the situation. During that time, the world went through even more political and economic changes. The walls were coming down in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet bloc. These economies were turning to market forces and international trade. More and more developing countries also realized that they could gain substantially by opening up their markets and participating more fully in world trade. Finally, when ministers gathered in Marrakesh in April 1994, they had before them an agreement that represents the most far-reaching reform of the trading system since GATT's birth. The Uruguay Round Agreement is complex, 
but it can be summed up in two important achievements. The first is the creation of a new organization with full legal status, the World Trade Organization. I believe it is indispensable from both an economic and a political perspective that the World Trade Organization should have the role that is foreseen for it in the concluded Uruguay round negotiations. Without that, the world into which we would be rapidly moving would be a divided world of conflicting blocks and countries with spheres of influence seeking the type of advantage over each other that has in the past led to wars and conflict. The second achievement is that the World Trade Organization's agreements form a single package with unprecedented broad coverage. The first major reform of trade in agricultural products. The gradual elimination of long-standing restrictions in textiles and clothing. A further substantial reduction of tariff levels. The first international trade rules for services and intellectual property. And a more effective means of settling disputes. The WTO agreements were agreed by consensus, which means that everybody concurred in them, which means that over a hundred countries that participated in the Uruguay round agreed without any reservation to this whole enormous package. There is flexibility. For example, developing countries are given more time to adjust, but in the end, no one opts out. Countries do not lose their sovereignty by jo joining the World Trade Organization. Basically, the World Trade Organization represents a contract between countries. Now, let's think of an individual. Um, I sign contracts. They definitely constrain my behavior. They limit what I'm going to be able to do. But I do this because I believe that there are offsetting benefits. The Uruguay round ended in 1994, but negotiations did not stop there. In 1996, the Singapore conference gave them a major boost. As a result, in 1997, three new agreements have been reached covering international markets worth trillions of dollars on telecommunication services, on duty-free trade in a broad range of information technology products such as computers, on financial services such as banking and insurance. Products and services in these sectors will be cheaper, of better quality and more widely available. Over the coming years, the WTO has several other negotiations to undertake. Many of them are inherited from the Uruguay Round. Others were added later. Major new negotiations in agriculture, services and other subjects are scheduled for the turn of the century. The Uruguay Round agreements will be reviewed. All of these are essential to keep the system up to date. In addition, the WTO members are studying competition and anti-monopoly practices transparency in government procurement, investment and other issues. They want to see if new rules are needed. World trade is now 15 times larger than it was 50 years ago. In most countries, the trading system has made a vital contribution to economic growth, development and technical progress. Let's remember that in 1950, the most wealthy country uh, was the United States. The Canadians were behind them. The Europeans were at half that level and the Japanese at a sixth. And we adopted open policies and what we saw was convergence. Today, our wage levels are pretty similar all around the developed world. And the same has been true of dynamic developing countries who've adopted open policies and integrated themselves into the world economy. Uh, I think that's the great appeal of an open trading system. It's precisely that it is a mechanism for remedying uh, the imbalances and the inequality that we have in the world economy. But alongside the promise, poverty remains. The least developed countries have difficulty tapping into the benefits of the trading system. The potential sources 
My country, which is one of the least developed countries, follows with interest the current process of globalization. We are convinced that this process, if it is well conducted, can stimulate the harmonious growth of the world economy, a growth that can reduce the gap between rich and poor countries. On the partnership more the can be done agencies. to help these countries catch up, and more is being done. Recently, 26 countries improved access to their markets for products exported by the least developed countries. Now is the time that we attack the problem of the least developed countries. And I can tell you that it is possible to eliminate poverty. The WTO, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank and three other organizations are now working together to reinforce development in the poorest countries give them training assistance and help them diversify and improve their services and industrial production. The WTO is not an ivory tower. How can public opinion and the private sector influence the WTO process? Through their governments. Governments reflect domestic concerns through negotiations or disputes that they bring to the WTO. Liberalization of world trade has been remarkable in boosting the living standard of populations and creating jobs. It's true there has to be some give and take as companies move their production from one country to another, with perhaps the relocation of jobs in certain countries and job creation in others. But I don't think we can go on indefinitely maintaining a dichotomy by saying, let's do everything at the national level, but we also want everything at the international level. There's a little bit of both. The system does help create jobs. All the jobs created during this last decade result from economic growth. In their turn, improved wages and standards of living have stimulated growth within companies, which have therefore been pushed into recruiting. Everything is interlinked. Increasingly, the trading system is asked to take into account other broad issues that spill across national borders. I therefore think it's also important for WTO to increase its own ability to learn from the global civil society. This is because the challenges of the next century are the challenges of the last century and the new challenges of the future. We have the challenges of poverty, a problem which is not going away. We have challenges of increasing malnutrition and hunger, but we have new challenges of global warming, of biodiversity. We have challenges which force us to live as one world. The trade rules give governments the freedom to protect their environment, to follow social policies that promote the welfare of their people and to pursue all these goals through other international organizations if they wish. The task of the WTO is to ensure that these legitimate objectives do not turn into protectionism in disguise. A new consensus is emerging that trade liberalization and environmental protection are not only compatible goals, there must be two sides of the same strategy to achieve sustainable development on a global scale. Looking ahead, the World Trade Organization faces several challenges. First, to keep pace with new priorities in a rapidly changing international trade environment. Not least, the new information technologies are shrinking time and space they will have a far-reaching impact on international trade. Second, the WTO has to ensure that the rules are applied in as much of the world as possible. That means bringing new countries into the system, including the few large trading nations that are still outside, such as China and Russia. Third, WTO members want to ensure that regional economic groups that are set up around the world support the global system. And fourth, being global means looking after the interest of the poorest countries so that they can benefit fully from the opportunities presented by a vibrant, up-to-date trading system. 
and perhaps most important of all, is to ensure that the system responds to the aspirations of people in every member country. These challenges cannot be met by imposing policies or values on one another. Well, I think that the main challenge is to build a universal system, a system which includes all the nation of the world inside a rule-based system, not a power system, where their relation will be made because of the rules that they have agreed together and not because of their power relations. This is certainly a very revolutionary objective. The world has changed dramatically over the last half century, but the basic choices we face have not. Governments have accepted non-discrimination and consensus as the basis for their economic relations. They have helped to make the world a safer place. In their turn, embraced privileges and standards of living to assimilate growth within companies, re-inter, which have therefore been pushed to